Deep under the surface of the Hainan Island, the Chinese Navy is building the world's first underground submarine base. While the US Navy is still supplying and deploying its nuclear fleet in the open, China, now the world's second largest military spender, will soon be able to operate its submarines in total secrecy. Meantime, in Beijing, behind closed doors, the nine-member Politburo chose a new chairman of the Communist Party, the new Chinese head of state. There were no other candidates, no other parties, and no presidential debates. Whether he'll be effective or not, there are no impeachment articles. There's no Congress or Parliament to uphold or deny his decisions. History has known many totalitarian governments, but none has ever ruled over the second largest economic power or over the most populous country on Earth. Today, the world cringes as the nine men of Beijing are about to unleash their economic and military power in the decades to come. But did it have to be this way? About a hundred years ago, the Middle Kingdom seemed to be on the path of becoming a proper republic. Fluent in English, its founder, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, was touring the United States, not Russia, in order to raise funds for a new democratic China. His friend and mentor was not Lenin or Trotsky, but an American missionary. At the start of the 20th century, China had no better friend in the world than the United States which was educating more Chinese exchange students than all other countries combined. In the meantime, the Russian presence in the Middle Kingdom was no more than one Eastern Orthodox Church on the outskirts of Beijing. Yet, by 1949, America, now the leader of the free world, had lost China to the forces of dictatorship and despotism. This film will investigate the events that turned China from the most promising American friend in Asia into one of its fiercest foes. The European policies were clearly imperialist. The Americans never joined in, in all that. And so while the imperialists were fighting over uh, terrain and interests and uh, rights and territories, the Americans concentrated on missionary work, education, welfare, health, hospitals, and so on. And they were very successful, did a lot of wonderful things for the Chinese people, at least they tried. So that was the American difference. We start our story on the campus of the Tsinghua University in Beijing. Every year, tens of thousands of young Chinese go through the extremely competitive admittance exam, yet few of them know that their school was built with American funds at the initiative of Theodore Roosevelt. The work started in 1911 when the monarchy fell and the new government appropriated a formal royal garden for the building of a preparatory school for students on their way to the United States. If the West had early experiments with democracy starting over 2,000 years ago, China, the fifth modern republic, was faced with the daunting task of replacing over 3,000 years of dynastic rule. The latest Chinese dynasty, the Manchus, descended on Beijing from Manchuria during the 17th century. 
For the last 200 years, they had lost every war except the ones waged against their own people. As they gradually accepted the foreign encroachments on China, the dynasty brutally repressed any dissent or attempt at modernization. I think it was not just that China did something wrong. China was doing, it had been doing all along. I think what happened was that something revolutionary happened in the West. The industrialization, scientific advance, and uh, what I would call humanistic approach to life that led to the rise of the West. In China, on the other hand, I think it suffered. If there's anything wrong with China, it was stagnation. It stopped looking for new ideas, especially new ideas in government, new ideas in terms of society. The period of maximum Western influence in China is also, from the point of view of ordinary Chinese, probably the worst century to be alive out of the last 10 or 12. One of the things that happened is that in the late 19th century, the Qing government moves massive amounts of resources to the coast. They move those resources there partly for defense because they're in a new world where suddenly seaborne powers are a real threat. You have to defend your coast in ways you didn't before. And they're paying massive indemnities for lost wars. I mean, the indemnity for the Boxer Rebellion alone is, if I can remember right, something on the order of four years worth of total government revenue. I mean, it's huge. That money's gotta come from somewhere. One of the things it does is it takes a bunch of the money out of what used to be used for flood control on the Yellow River in the inland areas. Because suddenly these inland areas are much less strategic because the place you're really worried about is the coast. Well, it's not surprising then that if you live in one of those areas that's flooded out, but you do have a sense that I'm not getting flood protection. All right, so here are places in some cases, inland areas where maybe no Westerner ever set foot. And certainly no Westerner ever sat there saying, hey, 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 let's flood these guys out. But being forced into this new world of competing empires does have very traumatic effects in a lot of places. By 1906, sensing the widespread discontent, the Manchus allowed for provincial assemblies as a first step to a long-term transition to a constitutional monarchy. These assemblies had nothing more than an advisory role to the Beijing court, but soon they gained tremendous local autonomy. While the imperial court was still relying on the mandate of heaven for legitimacy, the provincial assemblies were the first entities accountable to voters in Chinese history. Once China had a disastrous uh, encounter with the West in the Opium Wars of the 1840s and 50s, uh, some relatively far-sighted monarchs decided, well, if you can't beat them, join them, and they sent uh, some of the best and brightest young men abroad to copy Western gunboats and steel making and railroad technology. And when they came back, they came back filled with ideas other than just building things. They came back with societal reform uh, agendas. Sun Yat-sen was one of those young, bright and, and uh, eager young men who went abroad to learn the secrets of the West. And he like many, came back filled with ideas not just about science and technology and guns, but also about institutions, democracy, for example. 
The tug of war between the imperial magistrate and the local governments culminated in the struggle over new railways. Since the provincial assemblies raised the funds to build their own lines, they wanted to keep them under local control. The imperial court wanted a nationally integrated system and arranged for a huge loan from Western powers to pay for it. In 1911, they officially announced the nationalisation of all rail throughout the Middle Kingdom. Riots erupted, first in Sichuan and Wuhan. In a matter of weeks, 15 out of the 18 provinces of China declared independence and formed a national assembly. If Beijing was the imperial capital, Nanjing soon became the rebel capital, hosting a brand new parliament that voted Dr Sun Yat-sen as the president of the republic. Alongside Dr. Sun was Homer Lee, an American friend brought to co-author a new Jeffersonian-style constitution. However, revolutions cannot be won on ideas alone. If America had General George Washington and the Continental Army, the new Chinese Congress had no military muscle. It wasn't enough just to have a few thousand people with ideas, intellectuals. You had to have an army. Uh, China was so big and so feudal in its outlook that you had to have a, an army to unify it. And there was only one army in China, and that was the old imperial army, which had defected from the monarchy. It watched the monarchy fall, uh, but the guy who was in he uh, the head of the army had ambitions of his own, so he drove a bargain with Sun Yat-sen. Um, I'll put my army in service to your Republic of China, but you put your presidency on me. <laughs> Sun Yat-sen imported a, an American political scientist to write a democratic constitution for him, but it was all window dressing because real power increasingly gravitated into the hands of Yuan Shikai, who knew how to use it. Homer Lee, a gifted author and strategic thinker, was a man ahead of his times. In his 1909 book, The Valor of Ignorance, he predicted how Japanese imperialism would become a great peril for the United States. In his grand vision, a democratic modern China in alliance with America and Great Britain could counterbalance the imperial ambitions of Japan and Germany. Born with a severe handicap, Lee knew he could never serve in the US military. That did not stop him from organising, together with other revolutionaries, a small Chinese army in the outskirts of Los Angeles. This small force was preparing to secretly sail to China in 1912 to infiltrate and then overthrow the Manchu government. When Li first spoke to Sun, he knew that he'd met the man who was about to change history. So he immediately pledged some of the royalties of his books to the cause. Sun was so impressed with Li's strategic insight that he asked him to design a foreign policy for the new China and serve as foreign minister. A few months before the dynasty fell, seeing the opportunity of a century, Lee rushed to Washington and pleaded with members of Congress, many of them familiar with his books and theories. He proposed the issue of a US loan that could build an army for the Republic. The US Marines, already present on the Chinese waterways, could stall the old Imperial armies the State Department could prepare to recognize the coming Chinese parliament. 
his pleas fell mostly on deaf ears. The American century had arrived, but it seemed that no one in Washington was aware of it. As soon as he heard of the Wuhan revolt, Homer Lee joined Sun Yat-sen, and together they headed for Nanjing. Once in the capital, the Provisional Assembly voted Sun the President of the Republic. Lee, by now fluent in Chinese, was immediately appointed as the first Republic of China's Army Chief of Staff. With funds from private donations, a small force was assembled, but nothing that could face the armies of Yuan Shikai. The last hope for the Nanjing government was to obtain international recognition. As there was little hope that the Tsar of Russia, the Queen of England or the Emperor of Japan would easily recognise another republic, the hearts and minds of millions of Chinese turned towards the United States. William Suzler, a congressman from New York, quickly authored the Suzla Resolution, calling for the immediate recognition of the Republic of China. I hailed the Chinese Revolution as momentous in the annals of human history, and I think it speaks volumes for the moderation and patriotism of the Chinese people. No one has done more for the growth and the progress of representative government. Both chambers of Congress passed the resolution in April 1912. However, despite all the positive coverage in the American press, the Taft administration simply vetoed it. Committed to a neutral dollar diplomacy but personally sympathetic to the Chinese cause, President Taft's attitude was described by the press as a forced, unhappy marriage between idealism and commercialism. Sun Yat-sen succeeded in overthrowing the, the Qing dynasty. His group of revolutionaries did so, and he wanted a republic. Sun Yat-sen was very much inspired by the West. His republic was modeled on France and the United States. But what happened? He, he didn't get any support. So when you look at the general picture, the Chinese believe that the West actually betrayed, betrayed them for their own interest. Their own interest would be able to sell arms to the warlords, make allowed concessions which is in the territories that the warlords held, while Sun Yat-sen, standing for a new republic, the man who, who started the revolution, was left out. In more practical terms, the president was concerned that the US unilateral recognition might upset the other great powers in the region, especially Japan. At the same time, Nelson Johnson, the American consul of Shanghai, contacted Homer Lee and ordered him to step down from his appointment as the Army Chief of Staff. To the State Department in Washington, Lee was in clear violation of a federal statute that forbade Americans from taking part in foreign revolutions. A furious Lee replied through the Chinese press. I'm not an American officer, so I'm not under restrictions of the American military law. I joined the Chinese Revolution based on my personal qualifications and due to the humanitarian reasons as an aim. Today's China, millions of people are under torture by a repressive system. How could I sit there and do nothing?
Despite his apparent defiance, Lee resigned, fearing that he would only hurt the Republican cause by further antagonising the US government. Soon after, he suffered a nearly fatal stroke that left him blind and partly paralysed. Together with his wife Ethel, they decided to return to California, where they thought he could recover faster. He kept close correspondence with Sun Yat-sen, promising to rejoin him as an advisor as soon as he was well. Dr. Sun stepped down from the presidency three days after Lee's stroke, thus sparing China a civil war and partition. In fear for his life, he later took refuge in Japan, where he started the preparations for a second revolution. Homer Lee died in California in the fall of 1912. According to his wishes, he was dressed as a Chinese general for the last time. He had also asked for his ashes to be entombed on Chinese soil. It took until 1969 when, after Ethel's death, both their remains were put to rest with great honours in a Taiwanese cemetery. If today China has the largest currency reserves in the world, while the United States is the most indebted nation, that was not the case a hundred years ago. Dysfunctional and corrupt, the Yuan Shikai administration relied heavily on foreign loans. With the fall of the last dynasty, the imperial system of magistrates and tax collection simply disintegrated. While still the official capital of the Chinese Republic, in fact Beijing was barely controlling one harbour and a fifth of the country's territory. Democracy is a very complicated thing. Among other things, I believe that successful democracies require a shared political culture by all the elites in that country. Because if any elite group wants to take over and then stay in power and not continue to have a democratic process, if they don't all share it, then it will never be stable. For China, China was a big, big country and the penetration of European ideas was very slow. And many young Chinese along the coast were very impressed with the West. But they're still a very small minority. Vast territories of peasants who are not really open to these ideas, who have had their own way of life thousands of years, a particular relationship to their family, their land, their, who, who has political power. It's a relationship which has been successful for a long time. There were no particular reason to want to change it, at least to those people. Distrustful of the new regime, former imperial magistrates, generals and landlords formed their own fiefdoms. They simply applied the dynastic model on a smaller scale. These warlords would first raise a ragtag army using leftover weapons from the imperial guards. In a lawless land, they would use it to plunder the population, 
then sell their goods, lease territories and concessions to Western powers in order to acquire even more weapons. Perpetually at war with one another and the central government, the warlords reduced China to extreme poverty and desperation. The legendary irrigation system that lasted for millennia was left in disrepair. Famine and disease plagued millions of Chinese. In the meantime, in August 1914, a war like no other erupted in Europe. What you have to realize is that World War I breaks out in the context where a struggling Chinese state that's emerged from the 1911 revolution is trying to gain control over the whole country. What that means is that they need money. Um, the people who were ruling Beijing, their idea is give us a bunch of money, strengthen the army, strengthen the bureaucracy, you know, and we'll build a state from the top down. But we need the loans. When 1914 comes along, this is a big problem because suddenly every dime of credit is going to fund the First World War, right? I mean, it's just sucking dry the capital markets all over the world. As China was disintegrating, Japan was moving in the opposite direction. Upon his visit to the land of the rising sun, Lord Charles Beresford remarked, Japan has, within the last 40 years, gone through the various administrative phases that occupied England about 800 years. I loathe to say that anything is possible with her. All shogunates were brought under a centralised system of tax collection. Despite some opposition from a traditional society, the Tokyo government quickly implemented the social reforms of a modern state. If the sale of women was still common practice in rural China, Japan forbade it completely and even implemented mandatory education for boys and girls, a first for any Asian country. However, there was a lot more that the Tokyo elite was learning from the West. By 1910, more than half of the national budget was devoted to military build-up. In a world divided between colonizers and colonized, Japan was determined to join the former. In 1914, seeing the European powers taking each other to the abyss, Japanese Foreign Minister Keito Takaki exclaimed, an opportunity like this comes once in a hundred years. After waiting a year for the Chinese coffers to run dry, in 1915 Japan offered China a new loan together with 21 demands. The Japanese minister in Beijing also warned Yuan Shikai to keep these demands secret from all foreign powers, especially from the United States. The Chinese government is to agree that the entire Shantung Peninsula will become a Japanese possession. The Chinese government will no longer lease any harbor to any foreign powers but Japan. The Chinese government must obtain permission. Before obtaining any foreign loan, the Chinese arsenal must be under joint Japanese and Chinese management. The Chinese government, the Chinese government, the Chinese government, the Chinese government, Chinese government, Chinese government. A desperate Yuan Shikai immediately leaked the 21 demands to the British and American embassies. By now, the US had a new president, Woodrow Wilson, 
a former professor of political science, Wilson was a devout anti-imperialist and a champion of representative government. Once he heard the Japanese demands, he became incensed. Under US and British pressure, Japan reduced the number of demands from 21 to 13. By now, Yuan Shikai had dissolved the parliament, assassinated his opponents, and proclaimed himself the new Chinese emperor. Broke and resented by his people, he accepted the Japanese loan together with the 13 demands. Riots erupted all over the country. Consumed with chagrin, the most hated man in China died a year later. The Japanese, they never were subjugated by the Chinese. They never even paid tribute to the Chinese. Once they saw the West defeat the Chinese, they, be, they paid attention. If the Westerners can do it from that far away, we are so near, we can do it too. So starting from the Meiji Restoration period in the 19th century, Japan no longer regarded themselves as Asian. They thought they were European. They are both well-disciplined and brutal. The Japanese citizens don't, are not eager to display their individual charm and ambitions. They would like to get united, to form the team spirit, and then they think uh, their country could conquer anything, anything, anyone. Early in the war, Japan allied itself with the side it could not defeat. In August 1914, it joined France and Britain and declared war on Germany. Taking the isolated German colony on the Shandong Peninsula must have seemed a much easier prey than French or English possessions. Over 8,000 miles away from Berlin, the city of Qingdao was the headquarters of the Kaiserische Marine East a dear possession of Kaiser Wilhelm. It would shame me more to surrender Qingdao to Japan than Berlin to the Russians. In September, Japan blockaded Qingdao on sea and land. China, still neutral, protested at the Japanese encroachment. Japan scoffed. A small German torpedo boat struck first. In a matter of hours, the cruiser Takachiho lay on the bottom of the sea. Soon after, the Japanese deployed their first carrier, Wakamiya, for the world's first naval-to-land air attack. In contrast, the German air force in Qingdao consisted of two airplanes. Two months later, hopelessly short on supplies and ammunition, the German garrison surrendered. In early 1917, Germany unleashed unlimited submarine warfare in the Atlantic. Outraged by the number of civilian casualties, President Wilson called on all countries to curtail diplomatic relations with Germany. While most of the world understood the call as a rhetorical proposition, the new Chinese leaders followed the American advice.
Wilson was so impressed that he immediately telegraphed the US ambassador in Beijing. Tell the government of China how sincerely we desire to help China and that we are constantly trying to shield her against the selfishness of her neighbor. I don't want them to get the idea that we are unappreciative of their willingness to stand with us, which is singularly generous and enlightened. A month later, the United States declared war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. In a matter of weeks, China followed suit. And so the Chinese government wants engagement with the other powers as a way of fending off Japan, and they want resources as a way of solidifying their control over the country. The idea of entering World War I you know, must have seemed to them an absolute masterstroke, because a couple things happen. A, if you enter the war and can make some contribution to the Allied war effort, you can get the money spigot going again. You can get some credit. Number two, you can get a seat at the peace table and maybe get Germany's colonies. So the Chinese get involved in the war. They're not a big factor, but they're certainly a non-trivial factor. The problem for them is that the Japanese are a much bigger factor. About 20 miles from the English Channel, Rumingham hosts one of the many Chinese cemeteries in France. In the last two years of the war, China shipped over 100,000 laborers to the Western Front. Many of them were sent to dig trenches only meters away from the German defenses. An estimated 10,000 never came back, downed by enemy fire, cold and disease. Neither the workers nor the Chinese government ever got paid for their participation. All they had earned by the end of the war was a seat at the peace conference in Versailles. reflects still another change. It is 1919. World War I is over. The fountains play on. Descendants of the men and women who marched out from Paris in anger to grab Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette now rush out in joy to hail the 20th century peacemakers. Wilson of the United States, the Puritan schoolmaster with his vision of tomorrow that has nothing to do with reparations and revenge desired by the old world diplomats. This man is an idealist who truly... Wilson arrived in Paris with unprecedented moral authority. A victor that claimed no territories or monies from the vanquished, an impartial power broker that came to bring peace to the world. His 14 points could be summarized in two new principles, national self-determination and territorial integrity. Former parts of empires became independent nations. To avoid future discord, new borders were drawn on the basis of nationality. At the center of the new world order, Wilson envisioned a League of Nations an international forum that was to solve future conflicts through negotiations, not war.
While most European powers easily adhered to the League, Japan demanded that the new forum would treat Asians as equals to the Caucasians. France, Italy and a few others accepted what was now known as the Racial Equality Clause. However, for Lloyd George of Britain, such a thing was out of the question. He argued that the 400 million non-whites of the Commonwealth should never regard themselves as equals to their British masters, or that would wreak havoc through the empire. Despite his progressive views, Wilson also opposed the clause. Concerned with the upcoming 1920 election, the American president could not afford to alienate his voters in the segregated South. Without the unanimous vote of the great powers, the racial equality clause was set aside. The Japanese public was furious. The press accused the Western powers of hypocrisy and even called for Japan's boycott of the peace conference. Then the question of Shandong came up. Before the Great Forum, Japan and China pleaded. Japan fought for Shantung. We conquered it from the Germans while the Chinese stood neutral. China owes us millions of pounds in gold, and they don't make payments. Japanese Shantung is like a dagger pointed at the heart of China. Confucius was born in Shantung. Taking it from us, would be the same as taking Jerusalem from the Christians or Mecca from the Islamists. To tip the balance, Japan agreed to participate in the League of Nations. With a heavy heart, President Wilson awarded Shandong to Japan. The American Secretary of State Lansing was so distressed that he threatened to resign. Wilson's military adviser, General Bliss, also tried to plead for the Chinese. The president was unmoved. If the League of Nations was to bring peace to the world, that tiny piece of Chinese land was an acceptable price to pay. The Chinese certainly understood that the Americans would support them in the, in the peace treaty, allowing the Japanese to keep Shandong. And that was a tremendous blow to the Chinese idea of their own sovereignty. And that was something, I think, till this day, this is one of the things that the Chinese have never forgiven the West for. And the Chinese regime is also so rickety you know, that when the war ends, you know, the Westerners don't feel terribly, they probably don't feel terribly bad about selling out the Chinese regime because it's, it's kind of a mess. But certainly, you know, if you're sitting in China reading the 14 points, it sure looks to you as if that ought to cover you. And then, you know, the absolutely bitter disappointment when it turns out, no, no, you know, the Allies are going to play power politics. Japan counts for much more. Japan's going to get the concessions. The only power, in a sense, that isn't ideologically tainted, in the eyes of at least some Chinese, is the Soviet Union. Because it's new, it wasn't a party to any of those treaties. In fact, it makes a big show of saying, yeah, we repudiate all those treaties. Um, they're the ones who released the texts of a lot of the secret treaties to the world. And so in the eyes of, certainly not all, but some Chinese, the Soviet Union comes out looking better than anything else.
потому что мы желаем положить конец власти капитала и создать мир без империй. Мы клянемся. The Soviet Union will withdraw all Russian troops from Mongolia, Manchuria, and all Russian consular possessions. The Soviet Union repudiates all treaties between Tsarist Russia and the Beijing government and will enter new diplomatic relations based on equality, reciprocity, and justice. The Soviet Union will become the only sincere, uninterested friend of the Chinese people and will never interfere in the internal affairs of China. Vulnerable and insulated, by 1919 the Bolshevik leaders were doubtful that their regime could survive as the only communist government on earth. With its huge, impoverished population and weak central government, China seemed a natural candidate for a second Marxist revolution. Despite the generous terms, the Beijing government neither accepted nor declined the Soviet overture. Declining the offers would have further alienated the Chinese public, eager to see a Western power treat China as an equal. Accepting the friendship of the Bolsheviks would have offended the US, Britain and Japan, countries that at the time refused to recognize the Bolshevik rulers. As the Soviets consolidated their power throughout the 20s, a scorned Kremlin never delivered on its initial offers. The Chinese delegation left Paris in anger before the end of the conference. They were the only delegation not to sign the final peace treaty. The League of Nations never materialized to Wilson's wishes. If he succeeded to enroll dozens of countries from all continents, he failed to bring to the League the emerging superpower of the century the United States. You may call me selfish, if you will, conservative or reactionary, but an American I was born, an American I have remained all my life, and I must think of the United States first. I have loved but one flag, and I cannot share that devotion and give affection to the mongrel banner invented for a league. Upon his return to the United States, Wilson toured the country trying to gather support for the US participation in the League. With great foresight, he warned his constituents that another world war was imminent without the American involvement, but it was all in vain. Regarding it as a threat to national sovereignty, the US Congress twice voted against US participation in the League. Soon after, the president suffered a massive stroke. He remained bedridden for the rest of his life. Concerned with the military build-up in Asia, in 1922, President Harding organized the Washington Naval Conference. Under American pressure, Japan agreed to return Shandong to the Chinese administration. The Chinese press barely noticed. That generation of very idealistic and patriotic young people never really had a chance. The Chinese believed that the West actually betrayed, betrayed them for their own interest. It was that kind of background against which eventually 
people went to the next stage of revolution. When the, I, I would refer to the Russian Revolution was a, a, a new inspiration and offered an alternative to this very aggressive but and ultimately hypocritical and unhelpful Western competition among the Western powers which was actually destroying the fabric of Chinese politics and society. <laughs>